Adelaide Shoulder and Upper Limb Clinic. Innovative leaders in the diagnosis, treatment and surgery of the shoulder, elbow, wrist and hand in South Australia. Hi, I'm Oscar Brummie-Randell, upper limb surgeon specialising in shoulder, elbow, hand and wrist. I'm part of the hand and upper limb unit at Royal Adelaide Hospital and a clinical lecturer with the University of Adelaide. The purpose of today's video is to show a systematic approach to the hand and wrist examination. This will enable you to develop a list of differential diagnoses for common hand and wrist conditions. Before seeing a patient, make sure you have the right equipment. For a hand and wrist examination, a functional hand assessment is very important. This typically requires a key, a coin and a pen. Next, ensure you have adequate exposure. For the hand and wrist, you need to see at least from the elbow down and be sure to remove any bulky items of jewellery such as a watch, thanks Danny, or bracelets or big rings. It's useful to examine the hand or wrist while sitting with a table opposite the patient or if you don't have a table, a pillow is also useful with the patient resting their hands over the top of the pillow. And as always, before assessing any patient, ensure you perform adequate hand hygiene. Lastly, introduce yourself to the patient and ensure they're happy for your assessment. Hi Danny, my name's Oscar. Is it okay if I examine your hand and wrist today? Yes. Great, we're ready to begin. This exam follows the classic format of look, move, feel and special tests. Let's start with look. For the hand, there are lots of hints with a simple inspection, with many of the conditions having a classic appearance. First of all, I look generally at the hands, ask the patient to face them palm down. I'm looking for any lumps and bumps, which could represent rheumatoid nodules, ganglion cysts, simple tumours of the hand, hepatonones at the interphalangeal joints consistent with osteoarthritis. I'm then looking for any scars on the back of the wrists, and then ask the patient to turn their hand over to assess the palmer side. Again, looking for any of those same things, lumps, bumps, or any obvious joint deformities. At the palmer side of the wrist, I also want to have a look for any nerve compression signs. This includes wasting of the thena muscles and the hyperthena muscles, consistent with median or ulnar nerve dysfunction. Finally, I want to look at the so-called attitude of the hand. This is looking at the simple cascade of how the fingers are sitting. Danny's hand at the moment is sitting symmetrical without any obvious deformities. But in cases where there have been tendon lacerations or disruptions, this can give a classic appearance. If a flexor tendon had been injured, you will see all the other fingers sitting in a flex position, but the injured finger sitting in a more extended position, for example. Then look for any other obvious signs of deformity as seen in a Jupitron's contracture or a claw hand in severe ulnar nerve dysfunction. Sometimes there can be a really obvious joint deformity or condition of the hand or finger that can cause you to localise to that one point. It's important to have a systematic approach to assessment of the hand. So starting from a proximal location and working all the way distal is a good way to ensure that nothing gets missed and you don't get localised in on a certain area of pathology. Next we assess movement. A quick and easy way to screen for movement at the wrist is to do the following. Ask the patient to place their elbows in a straight up position. We then assess for wrist flexion by asking the patient to bend their wrist down. Bend your wrist back for assessment of wrist extension. There is slight asymmetry actually here with the right wrist. Then ask the patient to turn their palms towards themselves assessing supination, followed by palms away from themselves assessing pronation. Then ask the patients to come back and to slowly make a fist. This enables us to assess flexion at the MCPs, PIP and distal interphalangeal joints all at once. Thumb opposition is then important and then see if the patient can go thumb to little finger and if so, how far they can walk down their little finger into the palm. If there is any asymmetry or obvious lack of motion, you will then need to target in on that examination to assess if there's a passive and active mismatch. A passive and active mismatch can be from neurological weakness, musculoskeletal weakness, or a tenosynovitis. A better way to discriminate between MCPJ motion and interphalangeal joint motion is to ask the patient to first flex at the knuckles but keeping their fingers straight. This is assessing their MCPJ motion. 
Then ask the patient to do the bear grip, which is flexing down their fingers, but not making a fist. Next is the feel part of the examination. Before you start to palpate any areas of the hand, always ask the patient, is there any areas of particular tenderness or pain? This stops you from pushing or pressing on a part that's very sore and immediately making the patient anxious and also helps you target onto the area of potential pathology. So you can already be starting to think about your differentials. Is there anywhere in particular, Danny, that's sore or painful today? No. Great. The feel part of the hand examination and wrist examination is really just an exercise in identifying the anatomy that you're pushing and pressing on and what the potential pathologies are for that specific area of the anatomy. I like to start on the radial side of the wrist at the level of the radial styloid. I then make my way across ulna on the dorsum of the hand and then around on the palmar aspect of the hand. Starting radially over the radial styloid, testing for any radial styloid tenderness and for first compartment tenderness consistent with a de Quavain's tenosidovitis. And then move further distally just off the styloid into the snuff box. Here assessing for any scaphoid tenderness consistent with scaphoid fracture. Then moving slightly more ulna, we are at the radiocarpal joint. Tenderness here can represent synovitis, scaphoid lunate ligament injury or insufficiency, or even a lunate avascular necrosis called Kienbox disease. Moving further across the wrist in an ulnar direction, we reach the triangular fibro fibrocartilaginous complex or the distal radial ulnar joint. Tenderness here can represent pathology to the TFCC or the distal radial ulna joint, such as synovitis. Slightly more proximal and ulna is the extensor culpi ulnaris tendon. This tendon commonly gets tenosynovitis and in some cases can have instability and actually be resting in a subluxed or dislocated position further around more ulna on the wrist. A more specific test for the TFCC is actually on the volar side between the ulnar styloid and the FCU tendon, pushing in here over the fovea, looking for any pain. Then testing over the radial side before moving ulna. I test here the scaphoid tubercle, again assessing for any scaphoid pain that may represent a fracture. Also then palpating the base of thumb, looking for base of thumb arthritis um, or any tenosidovitis of the first compartment as it comes up the thumb. Moving further ulna, again, pushing over the volar tendons, which can be consistent with a flexor tenosynovitis or median nerve dysfunction. Then further ulna, we are reaching over near the pisiform bone, which is the mobile sesamoid bone of the wrist. This is normally a non-tender bone, but is mobile. Just to the radial aspect of this lies Guillon's canal, where you can have ulnar nerve compression and should be assessed for any signs of ulnar nerve dysfunction here as well. After that, I then want to have a look at the fingers and look and specifically if there's any areas of tenderness or joint deformities that you might like to palpate. Any lumps or bumps that you see on the hand should also be palpated for their consistency. You wanna figure out if it's firm or fluctuant and whether or not it's tethered to any adjacent structures. Next we'll perform the special tests and we'll start with the functional assessment of the hand. Starting with the lateral pinch grip or key grip. Danny, can you pick up that key and pretend to turn it in a door lock? Great. Next of all is the pinch grip. Ask the patient to pick up a coin and watch them pick it up off the table, ensuring that they just use their thumb and index finger. If you don't have a coin, you can also do this with the key. Next we'll perform the precision grip test using a pen and asking the patient to pick it up and write their name on a piece of paper. Okay, next is the power grip. Um, we ask the patient to use your fist like it's a doorknob and to turn it. Great, next is a hook grip, which is simulating picking up a suitcase. Ask the patient to grip with your fingers and pull apart, testing their grip strength. Good, and finally is a cylindrical grip. You can use your forearm or a water bottle and asking the patient to grab on and squeeze hard. The functional assessment of the hand should be performed in all patients when doing a hand and wrist examination. We will now go through all the other special tests that can be performed for the hand. There are lots of them, but typically you only need to do three or four depending on where the specific area of concern is. 
First, we'll start with special tests for the radial side of the hand. Let's start with the base of thumb. We would have had hints here during the look, feel and move section of tenderness and deformity at the base of the thumb. We're trying to elicit any pain at the CMC joint of the thumb by performing what's called an axial grind test. This is done by pushing axially down the thumb while stabilising the wrist and circumducting. This is typically painful as a positive test. We'll then move to the scaphoid. If you ask the patient to radially deviate their wrist and extend their thumb, this will expose the anatomical snuff box. The classic test is elicited by pushing in the snuff box, which is onto the scaphoid waist. Here we're looking for any tenderness. It's easy to get confused by the radial styloid, which is just prominent and also very prominent. So make sure your finger drops into the snuff box where you'll then feel the scaphoid. You can also test on the scaphoid tubercle, which is the most prominent volar bone on the palm side of the wrist. Just below the base of the thumb, you can feel the scaphoid tubercle. Gently palpate here for any signs of tenderness. The axial grind test that we did for the thumb can also be done to elicit scaphoid tenderness as well. Next, we'll perform the Watson shift test, which is done to elicit any signs of instability between the scaphoid and lunate bones, which can be caused by scaphoid ligament insufficiency or a scaphoid non-union. Ask the patient to sit up in a arm wrestling position. You then palpate the scaphoid tubercle with your thumb and rest your index finger on the back of their dorsum of their scaphoid like so. You're placing a volar pressure on the scaphoid tubercle with the patient in an ulnar deviated position. As you bring the wrist back into radial deviation, the scaphoid will want to flex. You should feel pressure on your thumb as the scaphoid tubercle is pushing against your thumb. If there is a scaphoid lunate ligament insufficiency or an old scaphoid non-union, the scaphoid is able to stay in the, in the extended position and not push on your thumb. You will feel no resistance as you go from an ulna to radial deviation. And as you let go of the thumb, you will feel the scaphoid or see the scaphoid clunk back into position. A positive test here can be from pain, crepitus, or a clunk. The clunk is from, as you're pushing the scaphoid tubercle, you are dorsally subluxing it. And then as you let it go, it clunks back into its natural position. Pain can be felt from either a scaphoid ligament injury or a non-union site. The crepitus that you could feel is usually from chondromalacia on the scaphoid rubbing against the radial carpal joint. Next, we'll assess for dequervanes or first compartment tenosartivitis. We would have had hints about this in our earlier examination with pain and or tenderness located over the radial styloid. First of all, palpate along the first compartment, which is along the radial styloid of the wrist. Then we'll perform the Finkelstein's test. This is done by asking the patient to place their thumb in their palm and then make a fist around their thumb and then ask to actively ulnarly deviate their wrist. If there is pain felt along the radial aspect of the wrist, this is a positive test. Next, we'll assess the distal radial ulnar joint. We'll first perform the piano key test. A positive test here is from pain, dislocation, or increased laxity. Ask the patient to set up in the arm wrestle position. You then want the hand or wrist in a neutral position, not extended overly or not flexed. With one hand, you want to stabilize the wrist and hand using the palm all the way down the forearm and then the fingers grasping over the metacarpals, locking the hand and wrist in this straight position. Your other hand then grabs on the distal ulna and simply pushes it backwards and forwards. This test is performed in a neutral rotation, a half supination and half towards pronation. We'll start in neutral position. That is a stable and no pain is elicited. Moving to half pronation and into half supination. Next we'll perform special tests for ulnar impaction syndrome. Ask the patient to set up in an arm wrestling position. Stabilize the forearm and wrist with one hand. We'll then perform the ulnar impaction test. A positive test here is pain, which is from the ulnar head causing ulnar impaction. 
you place the hand and the wrist in a extended position, starting from supination or neutral and swinging around into full pronation. It will be often painful at the extremes of pronation. Next is the ulnar impaction maneuver. This is more assessing for ulnar styloid impaction. We place the arm and wrist and forearm in the same position and then the wrist is then placed into full ulnar deviation and move from a flex position into an extended position and from an extended position back to a flex position. Again, looking for signs of pain, which is consistent with ulnar styloid impaction. Next, we'll assess the extensi carpi ulnaris or ECU tendon. First of all, we'll test for ECU tendon instability. Ask the patient to mimic a ice cream scoop maneuver and then going back the other way like swatting a fly. A positive test here is clicking of the tendon as it jumps out of its normal position on the back of the wrist. Next, we'll perform the ECU synergy test. This is performed by asking the patient to spread their index and middle finger and thumb apart like shooting a gun. You will then ask them to keep that spread apart as you attempt to squeeze them together. A positive test here will be ballooning of the extensi carpi ulnaris tendon on the back of the wrist. Next, we'll perform the mid-carpal instability test. Stabilize the forearm with one hand and the hand with the other. Next, you want to shuck the wrist back and forth from a volar to dorsal direction, feeling for any subluxation or dislocation through the radiocarpal or mid-carpal joint. Next, we'll now assess the volar aspect of the wrist. We'll start with the flexi carpi ulnaris. Start by palpating over the FCU tendon as it emerges from the distal forearm towards the wrist. A positive test here is pain, indicating FCU tenosynovitis. Next, we'll look for piso-triquetral tenderness with an axial grind test. Locate the pisiform, which you can move from side to side easily. We're now going to push in a dorsal direction over the pisiform, looking for any tenderness between the pisiform and triquetral bone. A positive test here is pain. We'll now move from a ulnar to radial direction, starting with the carpal tunnel. There are three tests for the carpal tunnel. We'll start with Durkheim's compression test. That is just applying manual pressure from a volar to dorsal direction overlying the carpal tunnel in between the thena and hyperthena eminence. You typically need to press a push here for up to 30 seconds. A positive test is reproduction of the carpal tunnel symptoms, which would be paresthesia or tingling along the thumb, index, and middle finger. Next is the Tunnels test, which is similar. This is evoked by tapping over the carpal tunnel and looking for a reproduction of those same symptoms. The final test is Phelan's test, which involves placing the hands in a far flex position, pushing against each other. The idea here is to increase the pressure within the carpal tunnel. This test is good, but not all patients are able to achieve that level of range of motion. So the Durkheim's compression test is a good one to do instead. We'll now move across to the flexi carpi radialis, which you can see well on this patient. Start by just palpating along the FCR tendon, looking for signs of pain or tenderness, consistent with tenosynovitis. Next is the isometric test for the FCR. We're trying to isolate a sustained contraction of the flexi carpi radialis muscle whilst we palpate along it. Ask the patient to put their wrist in a neutral position, but with radial deviation. The radial deviation is important to help isolate the FCR tendon. Then ask the patient to hold their hand there, keep it there and don't let you move it, whilst palpating along the FCR tendon. You can see the tendon tense from the strong sustained contraction. Walking the thumb up the tendon, looking for any signs of tenderness. A positive test here is pain. Next, we'll perform special tests for the tendons that move the fingers and the thumb. Often patients can present with lacerations anywhere over the palm or hand, and so being able to differentiate which tendons might be damaged is important. We'll start with a tenodesis test. This is a good one to perform as a screening test to pick up any tendon abnormality. Place the patient's hand from a full extended position. We are looking for a flexion cascade of all the fingers. 
As we bring the wrist up into full extension, the flexor tendons are becoming more taut. If a flexor tendon is damaged or disrupted, then that tendon itself will stay in an extended position. As we move from extended flex position, fingers will extend. A tendon that has an extensor disruption here will stay in a more flex position relative to the other fingers. This is a passive test. Next, we'll assess the tendons that move the thumb. We want to isolate the flexor pollicis longus tendon. It's important to do that by isolating the interphalangeal joint of the thumb and not the metacarpal phalangeal joint. Hold the thumb in an extended position and lock the metacarpal phalangeal joint. Then ask the patient to flex the end of the thumb whilst you hold it in a fully extended position. Danny, can you bend your thumb down for me? Great. This is isolating the flexus pollicis longus tendon and indicating that it's intact and working. The opposite is then done to assess for the extensor pollicis longus tendon, as opposed to the extensor pollicis brevis tendon, which works at the MCP joint. We want to isolate the end interphalangeal joint of the finger and ask the patient to pull it up in an extended position. Next, we'll test both the FDS or flexor digitorum superficialis and FDP, flexor digitorum profundus of the fingers. FDS mobilizes the proximal interphalangeal joint, whilst FDP will flex the distal interphalangeal joint. To isolate these movements, we'll start with FDS. You want to hold the other fingers down. We'll test the middle finger in this instance, and we'll hold the other fingers down in extension, locking them there in that position. Then ask the patient to flex whichever finger you're testing. Can you bend your middle finger? By locking these fingers in extension, we're disabling the flexor digitorum profundus muscle from being able to flex. As we can see here, the end digit is mobile, even though she's forcibly contracting the flexor tendon. This is an intact flexor digitorum superficialis. To isolate the FTP, we hold the PIP joint in a locked extended position and then ask the patient to flex the digit. Flexion here indicates an intact functional tendon. Next, we'll turn the fingers over and look for the extensor tendons of the hand. Ask the patient to lift up all fingers like so. This will be pretty obvious straight away if there's an extensor tendon disruption as there will be a drop finger of the one affected. We can then attest further for the supplementary tendons which go to the index finger and the little finger. If we ask the patient to flex the middle and ring, but then extend the index and little finger whilst flexing the middle and ring, the patient should be able to maintain an extended position of both the index and little. This is the extensi indices tendon to the index and the extensi digiti minimi to the little finger. These are both functioning in this instance. This can be a useful test to do as the extensor indices tendon is sometimes used as a tendon transfer when there's a tendon injury to the other fingers. Next, we'll perform isolated tests for specific extensor tendon or the central slip insertion on the proximal interphalangeal joint. The Elson's test is used to assess for central slip integrity. As there are extensor tendons that extend both the distal interphalangeal joint and proximal interphalangeal joint, it can be difficult to isolate the exact tendon to the PIPJ. This is done by doing the Elson's test. We move the patient into a position of full MCPJ flexion and then push on the middle phalanx, asking the patient to extend the finger against us. With your other hand, you then test if the distal interphalangeal joint is mobile. A positive test here will reveal a distal interphalangeal joint that is also extended as the patient has a failed central slip tendon that will recruit their lateral bands, which are the tendons that also extend at the distal interphalangeal joint. A Bunnell's test is then finally looking for intrinsic contracture of the hand. The intrinsic cause flexion at the metacocarpal phalangeal joint or abduction, adduction of the fingers as well. In this test, we're looking for over contraction or a tightness of the intrinsics, limiting the PIPJ motion. 
When we put the finger in a fully extended position at the metacocarpal phalangeal joint, we then assess for motion at the PIPJ. This should be equal to the motion with the MCPJ then in flexion. If there is a discrepancy here with reduced motion in an extended position, this can represent an intrinsic contracture or a positive Bunnell's test. Finally, we'll test the collateral ligaments of the thumb and digits. We'll start with the thumb and the metacarpal phalangeal joint. Stabilize the metacarpal with one hand whilst holding the proximal phalanx in the other. We then move from a radial to ulnar deviation, looking for increased laxity. We'll then move to the digits. The metacarpal phalangeal joints of the digits are best assessed at 90 degrees. This puts the ligaments in on taut for testing. Again, hold it there and then move it from a radial to ulnar side. The interphalangeal joints are best assessed at both zero and 30 degrees as there is proper collateral ligaments and accessory collateral ligaments, which can be individually tested. Holding in full extension and moving from a radial to ulnar direction and then at 30 degrees performing the same. And this concludes the special tests of the hand. Now, depending on what you found throughout your examination, you may also want to perform a generalized ligamentous test. And as always, always offer to test the joint above and below. In this instance, there's no joint below. You can also perform a peripheral neurovascular test if you found any neurological signs and also offer to then do a dedicated neurological exam of the cervical spine. This presentation forms part of the Adelaide Shoulder and Upper Limb Clinic's online educational series. If you would like to view more of our online education materials, please visit our website, asulc.com.au.